Welcome to the Gestalt IT Rundown, where each time we meet, we go through the week's news in enterprise tech with a variable degree of snarkiness. I'm your host, Stephen Foskett, while Tom Hollingsworth is hosting Networking Field Day this week. And joining me today is our good friend, Max Mortellaro. Welcome to the show, Max. Thanks. As you know, it's May 4th, uh, so I have to say, I'm contractually bound to say, may the 4th be with you. But I would also like to point out that it is, in fact, International Bullying Day. Well, I guess Anti-Bullying Day, which is entirely appropriate for International Star Wars Day as well. So if you are a Star Wars fan or if you're being bullied, today's your day. Now let's get into the news. Max, activist investor Elliot Management, who we've talked about before on this show, is pushing Western Digital to split in two, separating their flash and disk business to realize the value of the assets for shareholders. Shareholders like, uh, let me think, Elliot Management, which just bought a cool billion dollars of WDC stock. We've seen Elliot make moves like this before, uh, but what does it mean for WD? Well, hey, thank you, uh, Stephen. Uh, so what does it mean for WD? Well, that means uh, the wind of change is uh, up for them, I guess. So we know Elliot Management, uh, they've been active in quite a few, uh, let's say, IT technology companies. And uh, as you say, they're, uh, they have a strong focus, which is uh, delivering greater value to shareholders. And therefore, we can. what does it mean for Western Digital? Well, as you know, uh, they have uh, a flash division, uh, which is the uh, SanDisk part, if I'm not mistaken. And then they have their own uh, disk. I mean, you know, classic disk business. I was about to say tape, actually. So they have uh, their HDD hard disk drives. And of course, uh, if, I, if my understanding from what I read on the Elliott management letter to shareholders is that they assess that the value of the flash division equals the value of the entire business. So what they're proposing is to split uh, those two entities and probably get to do whatever else, spin off, sell it. I don't know what they want to do with the hard drive division and focus efforts on, on, the, flash, uh, on the flash unit. So that's what's up for them. I guess change is ahead for our friends at Western Digital. So with that, it's uh, my turn to ask you a couple of questions on what's up this week. And this week, Synopsys announced that they are acquiring Dast Solutions company White Hat Security. Uh, the merger will allow Synopsys to expand their portfolio to offer SaaS-based security testing and expand their Polaris application security platform more rapidly. So what do you think about this merger? Yeah, this is interesting because uh, most of us, if we know Synopsys at all, we know it more as a chip uh, EDA company. But of course, Synopsys has uh, broadened beyond that market into things like static code analysis and software composition analysis, effectively looking at the software that's running on the chips as well. Uh, that's what's going on here. White Hat Security focused on dynamic analysis uh, to identify security vulnerabilities in running applications. And uh, this seems to be a pretty good fit overall for Synopsys. Uh, White Hat was founded back in 2001 and took in about $50 million in funding. And Synopsys is going to give them a cool $330 million in an all-cash deal. So frankly, uh, there's not a lot to see here. Uh, effectively, we've got an acquisition that fits for Synopsys. It's not a terrible uh, financial deal for White Hat. And... Um, you know, it improves overall security of um, code and applications. So cool. Right on you, Synopsis. Nice job. Moving on, Max, uh, Nasuni, who we've just seen at a couple of field day events, has just purchased a company called DBM Cloud Systems. They're a maker of an advanced intelligent replication software. Uh, DBM was founded by a bunch of ex-violin memory staff who somebody we, we've also seen at our field day events and previously worked with Pure Storage to move data to the public cloud. Uh, what should we make of this acquisition, Max? Well, it's it's interesting one because, you know, Nasuni has a very strong presence. Actually, their, their solution, their storage solution is uh, is cloud-based. So uh, it's what we, we called in one of our Gigam reports, a uh, distributed cloud file storage solution, but which can so also be used, it can also be used as a cloud file system. So... Uh, in, in a sense, well, it's, it's interesting because uh, the, the solution is already efficient. They already have some kind of replication mechanisms for the data on the cloud. It, it comes down to what they will want to do 
in terms of technology. The thing which comes to my mind right now is that the Nessuni is predominantly based in the cloud, right? So what do they, what would they want to replicate? Are they looking at improving replication, you know, to uh, the cache failures that they have on premises at their clients to, you know, uh, speed up, I don't know, replication? Or are they thinking of adding some use cases there? Maybe some kind of, who knows, DR, even if it's not making in scope. I don't really know. I don't really know, but it sounds interesting nevertheless because it looks to be primarily focused on acquiring intellectual property on a replication technology, and that means that they plan to probably improve their uh, capabilities. So, Stephen, uh, up to me to ask you a question. So, AMD is looking to replace five nanometer chips with TSMC three nanometers uh, technology, actually, and that's what they are planning to put on the uh, on the Zen five CPUs. So this will be a welcome change, but apparently uh, it looks like AMD may have to wait because Apple and Intel, if I'm not mistaken, are actually in the bidding war uh, to, uh, to get access to uh, TSMC uh, production lines. So do you think that it was a good idea for uh, AMD to enter at this point? Well, this is interesting. Um, I think that the, the, well, the horse is out of the barn on this one. AM, uh, AMD is not gonna get uh, three nanometer uh, before Intel and Apple do. The question, I think, is why and what's going on here. So it seems weird to have Intel working with TSMC at all, because, of course, Intel has their own fabs and competing technology with this. Uh, but Intel, honestly, they don't have anything uh, competitive yet with the TSMC uh, three nanometer stuff. So they're going to try to use it as much as they can. Similarly, Apple, um, who is obviously the biggest gorilla around in terms of cash and spending with TSMC, well, Apple wants this stuff too for next generation iPhone chips and the, maybe the M2 or something. So what happened here is that Apple went to TSMC and got themselves a sweetheart deal that gives them access to the latest process node technology. And TSMC, frankly, is still uh, ramping this stuff up. They don't have much capacity beyond Apple. And so Intel came in and scooped it up for their Meteor Lake GPU tiles. Frankly, there wasn't enough capacity for AMD Zen 5 anyway, so it's not like AMD really lost anything. I think that the story here is more that Intel is going to be sort of uh, nibbling around the edges of Apple's M2 in terms of using any excess capacity at 3 nanometers, and AMD is going to wait until uh, TSMC ramps up before they're able to launch their Zen 5. I think the only real problem here is that theoretically we could see a situation where uh, TSMC maybe is late to ramp that up uh, and get enough production going on. And that could theoretically delay AMD's uh, Zen 5 CPUs. I should also note that AMD just released their numbers and they released a hot, hot quarter uh, and predictions for a hot, hot year, which is really in contrast to basically every other company, including Intel. And so frankly, uh, I think AMD really needs this uh, to happen. Uh, let's hope it does for their sake and also for ours, because, heck, uh, we use these things all the time. Now, Max, let's take a closer look at some of the bigger stories here. And frankly, the big story this week is an event that's going on right now, Dell Technologies World. Uh, we weren't invited to Dell Technologies World. In fact, they didn't invite any influencers to this event this year, but we've been watching from afar and uh, some of our friends are there. Uh, hi, Tim. And uh, tweeting about the thing. Uh, I think we do have to talk about some of the announcements from Dell Technologies World. I think we should also talk about the overall impact of DTW this year. But let's start with the announcements. So uh, we heard that they're uh, expanding their Apex on-premises and public cloud cyber resilience services in partnership with Snowflake. They've also upgraded uh, the familiar PowerMax, PowerStore, and PowerScale storage solutions, as well as their PowerFlex HCI solution. And finally, we heard that they're ramping up Project Alpine, which we heard about last year, um, this follows competitors like NetApp and Pure Storage who are offering storage solutions in all the major uh, cloud, uh, public cloud uh, providers. Uh, Max, I guess start with uh, Dell Technologies World overall. This is a different year uh, for it, but I guess that's the pandemic for you, right? Well, absolutely. And uh, of course, uh, I mean, putting the, uh, the world influencer slash analyst put topic aside, it's, it feels like a kind of a, of a reset in terms of how the event is taking place. Also, what's interesting is that there were not many, at least I didn't had a chance to dig 
unless you to dig deeper into that. But I didn't see any kind of major announcement around technology. It is more centered around the services. And what, what's kind of interesting there is, you know, I was having a discussion with our great friend, Greg Farrow. Hi, Greg. Uh, around the, um, you know, what's going on and what may be the cause of that. And Greg was, you know, rightfully mentioning that all of the vendors are more or less uh, kind of, uh, how to say, affected by a kind of supply chain issues, right? So it is not a really perhaps a good moment, you know, to talk about hardware releases when you're not even able to properly source, you know, chips, hardware, whatever it is. And everybody says that, uh, you know, hyperscalers are the first getting served in, into that. So maybe that's why we have this very deep focus on uh, services, on delivery models, and software-based solutions. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that it's important to note that, uh, you know, Dell's Apex and Project Alpine, these things are absolutely competitive with the solutions that some of their competitors are offering. So, I mean, you can't talk about Apex without also talking about HPE's GreenLake. And, um, you know, Pure Storage and NetApp both have sort of uh, as-a-service on-premises solutions like that. And frankly, you can't talk about Project Alpine without looking at what Pure and NetApp have been doing, especially in public cloud solutions, offering uh, those uh, products there. And, and I think that uh, from my perspective, I would say that HPE is probably the, uh, the one to follow with their on-prem uh, as a service offering with GreenLake. I mean, that's really transformed all of what HPE is doing. And NetApp, I think, is the one to follow in public cloud because they've been doing such a great job of moving uh, their cloud solutions, moving all of their offerings uh, into the public cloud providers. And in fact, right now, you can basically just go on uh, your favorite public cloud. You can sign up for some storage and boom, it's NetApp, surprisingly enough. So uh, Dell is, I think, really a follower here. And uh, frankly, the fact that they're partnering with Snowflake is also sort of a follower move, in my opinion. Um, basically, Snowflake is the darling uh, right now with their big uh, data warehouse uh, solutions. And so it makes sense to partner with them. Let's, uh, let's get this running on our object stores. So, you know, overall, I'm not seeing a lot of announcements here. I mean, for me as a storage nerd, frankly, I'm uh, excited about what they're doing with PowerMax and um, and with uh, PowerStore and PowerScale. I mean, these are uh, basically the, the bedrocks of on-premises data center enterprise storage, and they're ramping up performance. I mean, they're saying that PowerMax is twice as fast as it used to be. Uh, I suppose that that's based on you know the, the, the usual suspects of uh, NVMe and Flash and stuff like that. Uh, PowerStore also uh, is supposed to have a better uh, application performance, and uh, PowerScale is getting QLC Flash to deliver uh, more capacity as well. So, I mean, uh, this is all cool. Uh, this is the kind of incremental updates. And frankly, if I was at Dell Technologies World on a normal year, uh, I would be all, you know, cool, PowerMax, PowerFlex, you know, because that's the kind of stuff that I get excited about. And I imagine you would too. Uh, but that being said, I think Dell was actually smart to focus the keynotes more on Apex and GreenLake and Project Alpine, because uh, frankly, those keynotes aren't necessarily for people like us who are writing and speaking about it as much as they are for investors. And investors are going to take a look at this thing and they want to hear what's the future? Where is Dell going in the future? How is Dell getting into software as a service? How are they getting into the public cloud? And that's really what the focus was for these keynotes, even though it was a little bit distasteful for people like us. Right, Max? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, you said there several things which are really interesting. I'd like to cover each of those and I hope I'll try to do that in a quick way. So the first thing is around the orientation, right? I mean, uh, Apex versus what's already existing at other vendors, for example, GreenLake being the most emblematic. I think that on that point and, and touching also on the hardware, which you said before, I, I, even if Apex is, let's say, new to the market uh, compared to GreenLake, uh, I, I still appreciate one thing with Dell Technologies is that I still have a view on the hardware which is behind the service, which is something that you do not have, unfortunately, with HPE and something I'm really struggling, right? So when I go, when I look at Dell Technologies portfolio, you say Perfol, Permax, uh, Perflex, Persor. Here we have three products. Each of them is differentiated, covers a specific use case, has very specific capabilities, but also is part of an ecosystem with Cloud IQ and so on. And I can, as even if I'm, if my company, my CIO, whatever, is looking to 
consume as a service in a cloud-like fashion, I can still say, okay, we're going to be a blend of these for these workloads and that. I do not have this level of visibility with GreenLake, for example, where the hardware has become so abstracted that unless you have, let's say, a deep understanding as a partner of the their ecosystem, it's really hard for you to figure out what they're selling at all, right? So that's that's one of the things I appreciate there. And uh, the other uh, the other topic we were talking about as well was regarding the uh, the orientation towards the audience. Oh, absolutely, that's true, and that's it is it is what it is. I mean, they're they're really focusing on the investors rather than the administrator. Sometimes they they want to talk to the dev persona, but the, the reality is that when you're deploying these kind of infrastructures, unless you're really going for the as a service approach, uh, you will still have to manage. Uh, to deal with the architects, with the uh, operations people, and so on. Yeah, and and I think that that's absolutely true. And, and I think that uh, you know Dell would be wise to not overlook that factor. So let's let me zoom in there uh, on what you're saying. Is that basically you know Dell Technologies customers like yourself, you do care what's underneath the hood, and frankly, if if what you were doing did if what was under the hood didn't matter, especially. I want to talk about public cloud. If what was if it, if if the nature of the solution didn't matter, then it wouldn't matter if it came from Dell or Pure or NetApp or HPE. Uh, it really just wouldn't matter. But the truth is, it does, and there is a link. I mean, I, I don't want to get all weird, but the hybrid cloud uh, vision is a reality. And frankly, you know, companies have to keep in mind that their core customers are transitioning into this world where they're going to want something compatible in public cloud. That's what I see Dell doing. That's what Pure and NetApp and HPE and Vast and everybody else are going to have to do. They're going to have to figure out a way to offer something compatible in the public cloud that allows companies to extend their data center footprint into the cloud and vice versa to to, to get things from the cloud into their data center. And uh, I think that that's really what's happening here. Um, unfortunately, that's a really, really hard thing to do. Uh, it looks to me like Dell, for the most part, is basically porting their hardware into software to run on Amazon AWS, which, you know, I mean, that's a great first step. That's a great step. It's important for the company to do that because it means that they'll have a compatible solution in the cloud. Uh, but NetApp has been doing that for years, and they're already on the next step which is to make these things truly integrated, to focus on the cloud APIs and the cloud integration, and most importantly, to integrate with the service providers themselves. So that when somebody goes to the portal and selects, oh, I need a NAS, they, they drop the menu down and they just get NetApp. That's gonna be a lot harder uh, for Dell to, to compete with and keep up with. And frankly, um, I wonder if they'll ever get there because NetApp already kind of has uh, claimed that space in the market. But that being said, this is a big market. And I think there's a lot of space for companies to offer various solutions. And there are a lot of customers. Remember, Dell has a huge number of enterprise customers, enterprise storage com- customers especially. All those people want this stuff. So saying that Project Alpine isn't quite what as good as what NetApp's doing, well, that doesn't mean that Project Alpine is bad. In fact, it means that it's just great. I mean, they're doing what they need to do which is to attract folks like you uh, for cloud solutions. And I think the same is true, honestly, of Apex versus GreenLake. It's not an Apex or GreenLake solution. It's a Dell customer saying, hey, we want some of that stuff too. And Dell saying, yeah, we can do that now. And their customers are happy. So I think we need to stop framing everything as a shootout with uh, winner take all because it's really not that way or we wouldn't have all these companies to begin with. No, that's absolutely true. And, and maybe one, one last closing comment as well, and I think it touches what you said, um, is that, uh, you know, all of these vendors, you know, HP, uh, Dell, but also Pure, NetApp, and so on, they're all pushing this, uh, this you know, uh, cloud economics and pay-as-you-go story, where you go, you consume the services, and so on. But I think that, you know, uh, a lot of companies which have had previous experience with the cloud and this uh, consumption model, they know that costs can really get out of control no matter 
or well you frame that. So I think that even, and, and that goes to the hybrid cloud story, right? You want to use the services, you want to have the flexibility. However, you still maybe want to retain a portion of your infrastructure on premises under control in, an, in a CapEx model because you want to kind of hedge against the risk of, uh, let's say, uncontrolled cloud span, perhaps. So maybe it's just my perception of that. Maybe it's what I will do. I'm, I tend to be a bit more conservative, but you know, you have this thing, it's there, you have it and you have the capacity, you have the support plan. Maybe it's the old way, the old school way of doing things, but you know, it's there, it works, it's proven. And, uh, and, and you do not incur the risk of a, of a service, you know, being launched with fanfare and then, you know, crashing down two or three years after. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a seer. I don't know what's going to happen there, but I don't tell, I also don't know what's going on with HP and GreenLake, for example, on the other side, you know, maybe it's, it's hugely popular and massively adopted, but who knows what's the economics behind for the uh, the company which is selling that. That's very true. And uh, thanks for your opinion on this, Max. It's always great to uh, to get uh, different views on the, on the news, and that's what we're really about here on The Rundown. Thank you. So let's take a look at uh, some of the events that are happening this week and, and in the future. Uh, first off, uh, if you're wondering where Tom Hollingsworth is, well, he's over at Net Networking Field Day. He's actually in Santa Clara hosting our Networking Field Day event right now, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, May 4th through 6th. Uh, just go to techfieldday.com and you'll see uh, all the live presentations from that, or you can find them on your LinkedIn. Also uh, coming up in a couple of weeks is AI Field Day. You'll see me there in Santa Clara for uh, with a couple of AI companies on May 18th and 19th, Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, again, you can tune in for that at techfieldday.com. You'll also uh, see us at Cisco Live this year. Uh, June 12th through 16th, we'll be at Cisco Live. Uh, we're really looking forward to that. There'll be Tech Field Day presentations, but of course, there'll also be a lot more going on at that event because it's going to be uh, predominantly in person from the sound, uh, sound of it. And then finally, uh, coming up June 22nd through 24th, we've got our next Cloud Field Day event. So go to the Tech Field Day website and uh, look at what's coming up for Cloud Field Day 14. We've got a lot of great delegates just signing up and uh, presenters uh, that we've been announcing as well. Uh, really looking forward to that event too. So remember that the Gestalt IT Rundown is available as a podcast in your favorite podcast application. So please uh, do subscribe and give us a, a like over there because that helps us. You can also find it on YouTube every Wednesday at Gestalt IT Video. We uh, also post these uh, on our Facebook page, on uh, our website, and in our weekly newsletter. We'll be back next Wednesday to talk about all the IT news of the week that was. Until then, for myself, for Max Mortellaro, and for Tom Hollingsworth, uh, thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you next week. And we hope that this is a good techie week for you. And, and finally, I'll just say one more time, may the fourth be with you.